So I woke up this morning and turned on the news and there was a tweet in Trump fashion from Jason Kessler. He was the right-wing blogger who organized the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And you know what he had to say? He said, Heather Hare was a fat, disgusting communist. Communists have killed 94 million people. Looks like it was payback. And immediately my first thought was, I hope, I hope, I hope her mother does not see this tweet. I was so sad for Heather's mom in that moment, the loss of a child so young, but one who had the wisdom beyond her years to understand that she could not sit and watch from the sidelines. I was so sad for us to have lost a sister in the fight, and I was infuriated as how any human being can feel such gratification at the loss and death of another. But in a moment, the tweet was gone from my head because all I was left with was the feeling of hope that you filled in this room yesterday with your generous hearts and your desire for a better world and your commitment to unite together to fight off hate and bigotry. There is such tremendous hope and I'm so proud that you are leading it. The world needs us now more than ever before, sisters and brothers, and I know you will not and we will not let it down. So it's been a very busy year in Ontario so far. It's actually only August, so if you think about when you know we would have come here, it's about six months, I'll call it a year though. And a very exciting one at that. We're just at the cusp of pushing through legislation that will raise standards of all workers in Ontario. We're the second province in the country to introduce legislation supporting a $15 minimum wage, and it's about time. That's right. And make no doubt about it, it was not handed to us. We fought, we rallied, we lobbied, we protested, but we did it collectively with our community partners, with our allies, with our neighbors and friends, because we didn't want one more family to struggle on low wages that barely got them by. We could not accept that workers in a grocery store would stand in line at a food bank after work to feed their families because the grocery store they work at they could not afford to purchase the food from. We were plagued with horror stories of families that had to dress their children in snowsuits through the winter inside their house because their hydro was cut off in the dead of winter as a result of not being able to afford to pay their bills. And we pledged to fight for job security and paid leaves for the bravest of the brave who needed our support in finding a path out of violence. I want to recognize the incredible work of our Ontario Regional Executive and our standing committees. Our standing committee members started the year off with back-to-back -back lobbies in the media sector, fighting for a national pharmacare program, lobbying for a fair agreement in the dispute of lab for labor softwood lumber, and lobbying MPPs for the Changing Workplaces Review. And that's just the first six months of the year. I was so proud watching our standing committee members present on behalf of Unifor at hearings all over the province on Bill 148 and bringing to the discussion their personal narrative. They shared how a minimum wage would affect women particularly, or how two days for leave, of vict of leave, of, uh, leave for victims of domestic violence just wasn't enough for a friend who was trying to get herself out of a, a violent situation. They put a face and a story to each piece in the legislation. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you and thank you for your dedication, your unwavering support to the issues and challenges working class families face and for responding to them diligently, swiftly and with tremendous generosity. Your dedication, your activism has been a great source of pride and inspiration to all of us. Later on you will see a slideshow that will have pictures of our most recent workplace action, which took place just last week at the North Star plant. You heard Scott McAmoyle, president of Local 1112, and my really good friend, speak about this at the mic, and our national president, Jerry Diaz, speak yesterday of the actions that we took to fight back against an employer who easily was walking away from their responsibilities to those who gave their whole life to the plant. The night that we made the tough decision to end the occupation, the weather really was a reflection of our emotions and what we were going through that day. It was a stormy night, complete with pouring rain, lightning, and even tornado warnings. And still the line stood. 
And when it was time to make the tough decision to end the occupation, not one person looked relieved to leave the cold, dreary night after having to stand and sleep on the picket line for days, but nor was there defeat in anyone's eyes. And I'll tell you why. Because our members know that Unifor will never be defeated, that the fight will never end, and that we will always be with solidarity on that picket line. Our members came from Ottawa to Windsor, stood on the line, sat on the curbs, went to washroom in the bush, slept on chairs, in the cars and hammocks, but no one left. We are Unifor and we are different. The strength in our activism is second to none, and I honestly cannot find the words to thank you enough. At a time when your brothers and sisters needed you the most, you did not let them down. Stand proud of yourselves and each other. Thank you so much. Over the past year, Ontario has concluded its Changing Workplaces Review, a process that Unifor was actively involved in at every stage. The review generated recommendations on changes to both the Employment Standards Act and the Ontario Labour Relations Act, which became the basis for Bill 148, the Fair Workplaces and Better Jobs Act. It's a good act, not a perfect act, but it takes positive steps to help raise the floor for all workers, particularly those who are overrepresented in precarious work. The proposed legislation includes equal pay for equal for part-time workers, casual workers, seasonal workers, and temporary workers. Increased proactive enforcement of the Employment Standards Act and higher fines for employers who break the law. An expanded definition of employee and employer, improvements to scheduling, paid emergency leave, vacation pay, and so much more. This is a victory, but make no mistake, it's not over yet. The new act is only passed first reading and it is facing increased organized opposition by the business community. When the government announced that consultations would, place, would take place, our members appeared at 11 hearings across the province, speaking on Bill 148 and its, its effects on their communities, their lives, and the lives of their loved ones. The Standing Committee heard from Unifor members pushing for improvements to the legislation, including extending card-based card certification to all workers, stronger successor rights to stop the abuses of contract flipping, and protection for women through domestic violence, and extending the concept of broader-based bargaining. And on the last day of the hearings, over 50 Unifor members gathered inside Queen's Park the walls of the legislature were swelling with Labour members from all affiliates standing shoulder to shoulder, and the province and business community saw that we will not back down. Now, of course, one of the key proposed changes in the Act is the increase in minimum wage. If passed, minimum wage will increase from 11.40 an hour to 14 an hour in January 2018, and then 15 an hour in January of 2019. Almost a third of Ontario workers earned less than $15 an hour in 2016. Corporations have been vocal as they push back with cries of too much, too soon. These are the same corporations who have reaped the benefits as workers fell behind over the last decade in the emergence of the so-called sharing economy, where the only thing that was shared is the pain amongst the workers. All the work done so far on labour reform, all of it, has brought us to this point, and now we must do more to push for both the improvement and passage of this key legislation. The next few months will be crucial for us, sisters and brothers. We need to be visible. We need to be vocal and at every opportunity. I urge you to stay vigilant, to join us at every call to action. We are just meters from the finish line, but we have not won the race yet. It's that last push that will change the trajectory of how we work and live in Ontario. Of course, as legislation can be passed, and can also be undone. We are now about 10 months away from what will be a key election in Ontario. Patrick Brown's conservatives are emboldened. The truth is, Brown is talking a very good game. He says his conservatives are different, that they welcome union members, members of the LGBTQ committee, people of color, and of all faiths. But this is the same Patrick Brown, I'll remind you, who as a, federal, as a federal MP voted to reopen the abortion debate back in 2012. The same Patrick Brown 
who voted against legalizing gay marriage, although he now finds it politically expedient to march in pride parades across the province. Shame. Patrick Brown's not gonna make it easy for us with talk of inclusion and progressive policy. Our election scheduled for June of next year is going to be one that we are going to be in the fight of our lives for. Patrick Brown has swelled the PC membership from 11,000 to 80,000 and won two by-elections in his short time as PC leader. Make no mistake, we are in the same position this election as we were in 2014. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to do a repeat of 2014. We are going to mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. And I know you will respond and engage in this election. Right after this Canadian Council, our work begins, sisters and brothers. We will need a collective fight back, and I urge you to start discussions in your locals to identify the activist base that will be ready to go. We have too much at stake this time. As we head into the provincial election, health care still remains a key political priority for us. Following years of cutbacks, we finally saw some dollars go to the health care, but the recent Ontario budget fell so short of providing the necessary funds to clean up past damage and move towards a more progressive model. The $518 million announced will just barely maintain the current situation of the long wait times and extreme workloads on our members. Our members in the healthcare sector have taken a unified approach to bring the challenges to the forefront by highlighting a day in the life of a healthcare worker. These conversations with our members will be captured on a video in an effort to launch further ground engagement. This is a major year for us with respect to hospital bargaining in both Southern and Northern Ontario. Our members have lived through a couple of recent rounds of bargaining that were influenced by provincial government intervention, two years of zeros followed by minimal increases, all this while they face increased violence in the workplace. I want to extend the support of the Ontario region and its regional council to all of our healthcare workers. We know it will be a tough round and our pledge of solidarity is with you. <laughs> Ontario members have also been involved in other federal campaigns, including Softwood Lumber, a campaign that illustrates how action at the local and provincial level can aid a wider effort effort. On June 19th, a rally was held in Thunder Bay as part of Unifor's National Day of Action for Forestry Jobs. Hundreds of Unifor members gathered to support the workers in the sawmills that would see the greatest devastation. This summer, we also made softwood lumber the focus when Unifor attended the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference. At the conference, members from the forestry sector spoke with councillors and mayors from across the country to ask them to pass the local resolutions to call on the federal government to take action to renegotiate the agreement. Local governments and communities across Ontario have responded, including Thunder Bay, Niagara and Espanola who have passed a resolution demonstrating that the widespread support that we had and helping to keep the pressure on the feds. Of course, governments aren't the only ones we need to keep the pressure on. We partook in a lot of difficult bargaining this past year. I want to particularly congratulate our members at the Bellcraft on achieving their new collective agreement, one that includes a very strong protections against involuntary layoffs caused by contracting out. Now they're sisters and brothers at Bell Clerical, my home local, my home sector, are preparing to enter negotiations with key issues that we're still dealing with. It's like a dirty soap opera. I was there in 1996, outsourcing was the issue. We're here in 2017, outsourcing is still the issue. Including the loss of all good jobs going overseas, contracting in, contracting out, and furthermore, automation. Thanks to the commitment of a strong and involved caucus, the bargaining committee stands ready to face these challenges. Members are getting involved with a video campaign to let Bell know that it's time. As they stand up and say, again and again, it's time. It's time to give employees the respect they deserve. It's time for Bell to bring back the jobs they outsourced. We will not stand idly by as corporations ship our jobs away, as was done at the Cami plant in Ingersoll, a plant that has been honored for its efficiency, yet its workers still fell victim to NAFTA. And this is why our union has worked so hard to change these unfair trade deals. 
This is why we maintain that NAFTA must be rebuilt with a focus on workers and a creation of good jobs. While we have outside work to do, we also have some very important work to do within our union. At the last convention, we spoke of the work of the local union task force. One of the key deliverables was to identify barriers and determine the difficulties that prevented many of our locals from full participation in their union. I have had many conversations with locals who genuinely want to participate in the union, but face many barriers, such as finances, geography, lack of infrastructure, such as access to a proper office, phones, technical resources, part-time executives, and competing family and personal responsibilities. It's not easy, sisters and brothers. It's just not easy to participate when the responsibilities are so great. So it's incumbent on us to move forward on a strategy that will provide those who are unable to attend union events the same information and the same opportunities to get involved. Yesterday, we heard the findings of, the Uni of Unifor's equity audit. I'd like to express my thanks to Christine Macklin, Keishan Kashi, for the hard work of going from local to local and asking the tough but very relevant question. Kaylee, Mohammed, and the Human Rights Department have done a tremendous amount of work to bring focus to a very important conversation. Self-examination is critical in growth. It is important to know where we stand in order for us to determine where we need to go. As part of our union's ongoing commitment to equality, Unifor was a proud sponsor this summer of the North American Indigenous Games, which saw youth from across North America gather to participate. At the games, the athletes told their stories through competition, and theirs was a tale of empowerment. I was so inspired at the opening ceremony by the sight of more than 5,000 athletes who demonstrated that sport not only has the ability to inspire an individual, but also the power to transform communities, provinces, and the country itself. The theme of the games was Team 88, which references the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendation number 88. We must recognize the cultural genocide against indigenous people as we move forward and push for change. Unifor shares this vision and believes that we have a collective responsibility to walk the path towards reconciliation. And as recent events have shown us, there's a great need for us to come together to defend our values. We cannot sit idly by the world because the world is challenging us. History has shown us tragic examples of when people wait and endure abuses too long until they become intolerable before there's a complete revolt. The signs are in front of us today. Just look at what we witnessed in Charlottesville. Think about the response from the sitting president that he was sad to see the history and culture of the country being ripped apart with the removal of the statues. The culture he is sad about is of a colonialism so grotesque that it still hurts the heart to think of the pain of a strong and wonderful people who were chained, owned, and oppressed because of the color of their skin. The signs are there on the path of history being paved again in front of us. We must defend all that we have believed in and all the battles fought and won. The conversations of this council reflect that you're seeing these signs. Unite in your communities. All actions really begin at home, in your neighborhoods, in your locals. Heather Hare, who tragically lost her life in Charlottesville, saw the world through eyes of equality. She believed that she could make a difference, that if we act, we can make change for a better world. Her last public words were, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Very wise words, and ones that I leave you with. Thank you, sisters and brothers, and solidarity for a better world. <laughs>